I, I wish that when I was at the United Nations working at the U.S. Mission in the U.N. and we were negotiating a number of different things, either in the Security Council or in the General Assembly, I wish, we, I, wish I had seen, I think, a little bit more uh, dedication to uh, principles of sovereignty. I think that when you get into some of these multilateral fora uh, where a lot of these conventions are, are made, um, I've seen a weakening of sovereignty over the last few years among the Europeans uh, and, and their permanent representatives of the United Nations. And I see a, a real interest in moving towards a more uh, transnational order. I think that spirit is alive and well at the United Nations. And as I said, I would see it played out in the General Assembly and the Security Council, the Human Rights Council, uh, and some UN funds and programs. Let me, let me start with a story that I think illustrates uh, the nature of some UN negotiations. In 2001, the UN hosted a conference on small arms and light weapons. This was an effort to address the legitimate problem of illicit trade in small arms that find their way into conflict zones. But the initial focus on strictly military arms turned into something entirely different. Anti-aircraft guns and mortars were grouped with hunting rifles and common firearms, which obviously raised significant Second Amendment concerns for us. Now, the intervention given by the U.S. representative at the conference said that, quote, the U.S. will not join consensus on a final document that contains measures contrary to our constitutional right to keep and bear arms. This prompted one UN representative to lament, quote, America's irrational attachment to the Constitution. <laughs> I'm sure many of the perm reps in the chamber thought the same thing, but they didn't have the courage to say it. The Brits were privately upset with us, NGOs publicly criticized us, and they were upset because the purpose of initiatives like the Arms Control Conference is to eventually get some kind of international convention on gun control adopted, work the Senate to ratify it, and the debate would be over. They didn't succeed, but it was still a norm-setting exercise that, like other norm-setting efforts at the United Nations, has the goal of raising an issue to the level of compelling law or peremptory norms. And I, I tell this story because it illustrates the great difference between us and other countries on the nature of law. They don't share our mindset and view our adherence to our Constitution as peculiar and frustrating because it causes us to occasionally block consensus, which is the worst sin that one can commit in diplomatic circles. When we would lose lopsided votes in the General Assembly of the UN Security Council, I would tell my colleagues at State that doesn't make us isolated, it just makes us unique. <laughs> Many prominent UN member states, particularly among the Europeans and American and Western NGOs, support such concepts as shared sovereignty and transnational norms, all working toward the end of global governance. For them, the most critical role that the UN plays is international norm setting to foster global governance. And that concept raises sovereignty issues for us and for other nations who believe that global governance substitutes the will of the people for the will of multilateral bodies. The arms control story is one of many instances of policy encroachment by the UN on domestic issue, issues such as education or abortion or family law or the death penalty. The UN has repeatedly voted in different committees uh, to condemn the death penalty in a clear effort to make us and other countries follow suit. I remember when Ban Ki-moon assumed office in January of 2007, he was asked in a press conference uh, about applying the death penalty, and he said it's up to each member state to decide. The backlash in Turtle Bay was swift and severe because the various organs at the United Nations had come out against the death penalty. Ban was duly chastened, he retreated and acknowledged the position of the United Nations. I would like to get to a point where what Bond says is not controversial at the United Nations. Historically, international law has been concerned with matters among states, such as rules of war, freedom of the seas, and treatment of foreign nationals and diplomats. In recent decades, however, international treaties and conventions 
customary law and UN declarations have sought to affect policy on social issues that are the proper jurisdiction of American voters. Issues of domestic policy like family law, abortion, gun control, the death penalty are the subject of intense democratic debate at our state and federal level. And I think most Americans like it that way. I know the founders certainly did. Most Americans don't follow the progress of this or that UN convention <clears throat> or this or that conference on X issue. They vote on the issue and they think that's the end of the matter. Much of the development of norming within bodies like the UN comes as a result of people dissatisfied with the policy decisions made by voters at the state and federal level. So they take their argument into international fora to which we are members, and they work it through the back door, so to speak. And I don't think this contributes to the health of our democracy, and I think we need to be mindful of efforts to create transnational norms, because at the end of the day, we should protect the sovereign power of the American people 